good to be in the house of the Lord today. God's so good. I'm going to jump right in with things. The teenagers are going to go with Sister Melissa this morning. So if you're from the age of 12 to 18, not the way that you act, but your actual age. <laughs> the kids are going to hold 4 to 11. going to go with Michelle. All right. You ready? The rest of y'all stuck in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> We're going to continue. We're going to continue on with what we talked about last week. A couple more points we want to principles we want to look at. And if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to uh, Matthew 5, starting at verse 13. We're not going to stay there long. And then we're going to go to Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Next, after that. But if we can limit the moving around the best possible. I know we say this every week, and, but it's just this is a reminder for us to understand that we're in this open space. We don't have a foyer. You know what, how many know what a foyer is? It cuts the it cuts the sanctuary off from the doors, the outside doors. So when you move around and you go out those doors, it causes a big distraction for everybody else because we don't have a separation. We're going to work on separating that a little bit, but we haven't done that yet. So. The, the least amount you can move around, we appreciate it. We, we appreciate it. So, I understand you have to leave sometimes. I understand you have to go to the restroom. But let's just limit that. If, if you're not going anywhere, let's let's hang around and be respectful to our neighbors. Amen? Hallelujah. So, it says this in Philippians 2. I'm going to share this and we're going to go to Matthew. We're going to talk about the mindset of Christ, okay? Because this is the mind we've been given. As believers, this is God's intention and God's goal for our life. We conform to the image and likeness of Christ. That we have the mind of Christ. So if we have the mind of Christ, then it's important for us to understand how did Christ think. What, how, what made Christ operate or made him tick or made him do the things that he done. How did he think about things in life? And how does this apply to us today? The word Christian is a is a word that means to be Christ-like, but it's really a, a shallow version of what God's really made you to be. He's really made you to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. So, you're not American. You're not American. You're a citizen of the kingdom today if you belong to Christ. A citizen, a son, and a daughter king of the universe the one who created it all that's who you are today so Philippians 2 5 Paul he sets an example of this attitude that we should have he says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus <clears throat> let this mind be in you the new King James version is what it says in, in the NIV it says this in your relationships with one another in your relationships with one another this is important man in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. As your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ as Christ Jesus. That's a big deal, right? To think about yourself and people the way that Christ did. That's a big deal, to have that mindset. So, and he, he goes on to say numerous different times, I talked about your gates, right? I mean, you know your gates. Your gates, your mouth, your ears, your eyes, your, and your mind. They're gates to your heart. And it's important to protect those gates, to watch over those gates. And we have to give permission of those gates. In order for the enemy to have any type of effect into your life personally, he has to get permission through one of those gates. Right? Here's the thing. 
In order for the Lord to have permission and work in your life, he has to have permission to one of those gates. Right? It's, we, we talked about choosing this day. Right? The Bible says choose this day who you will serve. Right? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You've been given a choice. Don't never forget this. The greatest form of love is free will. Amen? The greatest form of love is free will. People say, you know, if, if, if God is so good, why does he let the enemy do this and do this and do this? Well, I'm going to say, if God is so good, why does he let you do what you do? Right? We don't act straight all the time, right? We don't treat other people nice. If God is so good, how can he let you get away with what you get away with? How can he let the criminals get away with what they, how can he let Satan, Satan's got a day coming. All of us have a day coming to stand before him face to face. We not forget that. But the greatest form of love is not control, but it's free will. Amen? God loves you so much that he freely make, lets you make a choice to, to love him back. And he'll let you choose that for the rest of your life until your last breath on whether you choose to love him back or not. So these are gates, your ears. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Right? The Bible actually says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. You have a choice to use your mind to glorify God, to draw near to God, to get closer to God. You have a, 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 a choice to, to choose of what you're going to watch. You're going to put before your eyes. These are gates. They're gates to your heart. The Bible says that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what is your heart being filled with? And that's why you know how you're talking. That's where your talking is coming from. And your mouth needs to be under the control of the Holy Spirit and not your flesh. Because your flesh will bring you down. It will bring you out. Your flesh will make you sick. Right? Your flesh will make you sick. Your mouth will make you sick. Your mouth will make you depressed. Your own mouth will have you going down the path that God never intended you to go down. So the mindset, <clears throat> the mindset is important, and we're going to look at the mindset of Christ today, and how he thought about life, and how he responded about things in life, how he treated each other, and who we're supposed to be. Matthew 5, 13 says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you, can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world. A city on a hilltop cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, it says, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Your heavenly Father. So, some principles that motivated the life of Jesus. We talked about this. I'm going to just reiterate real quick on some some mindsets that we have to break in the church. <clears throat> one one mindset you we have to break in, in the church and your life, and it's still being broken off of me today, and that is religion. Okay, righteousness. Okay. True righteousness requires more than keeping the letter of the law. Right? We think that if we keep the law, we're in right standing with God. But I want you to understand the law is pretty much, it can be kept, but it's pretty much an impossible thing to keep the law, number one. But number two, the law was created for man to be pushed back to God, but not to be right with God. Like, God, uh, man cannot maintain a right relationship by keeping the law. Because, because God never intended for us to just do works and be, be just this, this people that try to do everything just perfectly right. God desires a relationship with him. 
right? He desires a relationship. I want you to see that relationship is the opposite of religion. I want you to see today, you're not religious. Say this, I'm not religious. Okay? And it's important that you have that in your mind because I want you to see that Jesus was not religious. Jesus was not religious. Religion in root, religion in root is man's attempt to reach God. I want you to see that religion is the opposite of relationship. Relationship is that you have found him. Right? You you found him and now you seek him because you want to know him more. You don't seek him to get something from him and you don't seek him just to be right with him. But you seek him because you want to know him more. You want to love him more. You want to love him with your heart. Amen? You can never, I can never maintain right standing with God based upon my strength. Upon my works. Upon any activity that I can accomplish in the name of God. I could never obtain righteousness with him. That's why Jesus had to come. And we have to see this today. That religion wants to push you to the place of you trying to reach God through you. And relationship is the is the picture of you going only through Christ to get to Him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And He says, listen what He says, no one. Somebody say, no one comes to the Father except through me. That means salvation comes by by Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing is salvation. And that's hard for you to understand because if I would go around the room today and I ask you, how do you get saved? Yet you would say Jesus, but if I say, how do you maintain salvation? You would say Jesus and this and this and this and this and this and this. Right? That's what religion wants to fashion us into. But the way that you get salvation and maintain it is the same way. It's Jesus, 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 Jesus. Come on, somebody. Jesus, Jesus. Him and Him alone. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one that got you to the Father, and He's the one that's going to keep you to the Father. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. That's good news. Amen? Why? Because we fall into this place of, oh, I didn't pray. I'm not right with God now. Oh, I didn't read the Word this morning. I'm not right with God no more. We fall into this place, oh, I didn't, I didn't treat them exactly right. I, I'm not right with God anymore, right? And, we, and we, we move into this cycle of works, and we miss the point of what Christ has done. It's through Him and Him alone, right? Right. It's the understanding that God wants you to get you to to a place in your life where you understand you can boast about nothing. You can boast about nothing but Him. But Him. He wants you to get to a place where you understand that it's Christ alone that you enter in. And it's not nothing you can do to get to Him, nothing you can do to maintain a relationship with Him. So, true righteousness requires more than keeping the letter of the law. So Jesus made these harsh statements. He made these, these harsh statements going over the top, right? Adultery was acting out, right? It's, it's when two people, uh, it's when uh, a marriage is broken, adultery takes place. Um, but Jesus, he, he even took it a step further. He says, whoever looks, right? That's the gates. That's the gates, right? Whoever looks with lust has committed adultery already in his heart. So what Jesus is saying, he, he's wanting us to understand that, right, no matter how hard you try to keep yourself from, from not committing adultery in the flesh physically, that you can still commit it with your eyes because your heart's not right. That's what he's trying to tell you. He's trying to say that you, you're trying to do this in yourself to maintain a good relationship with God and not do bad things 
But I'm telling you, if your heart gets changed, you'll have no desires to do the bad things. Amen? He, uh, come on. And he was telling the Pharisees that they're worried about, right? They're worried about keeping the outside of the cup clean. Worried about keeping the things that their flesh, their appearance, their look. They want to look to the people like a Christian, like a believer, or like they love God. Right? But he's saying, you're not understanding. It's the inside of the cup that's dirty. It's the inside of the cup that's dirty. That, that's why I'm here, people. That's why I'm here. I'm here that if you come to me, I can take not just what's on outside of you. I can take what's inside of you, and I can transform it. I can give you a new heart, a new heart, a new mind. You have access to these things through Christ and Him alone. Amen? true righteousness requires more than keeping the letter of the law it requires personal relationship and the mindset and attributes of the king and has your mind renewed understanding you've been given the mind of Christ I say this because it's a revelation that the Lord has given me why do people come to the altar? Why do people come to the altar and, and give their life to Jesus and be baptized and be baptized even in the fire in the Holy Spirit and then six months down the, the road, their fire's gone out? Why, why is this possible if you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost? I'll tell you why it's possible. The mind never changed. You got to understand you can have an experience on top of experience on top of experience with God, but if your mind never changes you're not going to change. You're eventually going to go back to the old life. Right? You're eventually going to go back to the old life. Right? Because whoever controls the mind will eventually control your life. And if God's not in control of your life, and He's not, and if you're not renewing your mind in Christ, you're eventually are going to go back to the old way of doing things. So how do you receive that mind of Christ? Understanding it's knowing more about God. It's filling your mind with God. Whether it be through worship, whether it be through praise, reading the Word of God, devotions, you fill your mind with Christ, and that's how it's renewed. The Bible actually talks about uh, washing of the Word, right? The washing of the Word, and it washes your mind cleanses your mind, purifies your mind, transforms your mind. And then you have to go on this, ma this maintenance of maintaining your gates and not just letting anything come through. Right? Amen. So, what does true righteousness do? I want you to see what true righteousness does because when, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to get this. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, He's the Lord of your life. This is another thing that's hard for religion to do. I'm going to step on some religious toes, including my own. So, when you give your life to Jesus, you're just as right with God as Jesus was. When you give your life to Jesus, God sees you as perfect. The flags went up, right? Perfect. Because you look because you you're looking at what you did yesterday, or the day before yesterday, or the week before, right? You're looking at that. You're looking at the wrong person. Quit looking at yourself. Look at Jesus. If he says I'm perfect in him, I'm perfect. Let me tell you why you're perfect. Because there ain't nobody that's not perfect in him. There's nobody that's not perfect getting in. Jesus, is Jesus perfect? Did he come and live on the inside of you? Amen? So God sees you as perfect in that sense. I'm not telling you your works. Don't look at your works. 
Look at Jesus. Because this is part of what righteousness means. It's pure, holy, different, set apart. Amen? But I want you to understand, he says these signs that will follow them that believe. Okay? That believe. Jesus, when, when he talks about going to all the world and, and, and proclaiming, right, the gospel, baptizing, and then he says, teaching, teaching all those that come to him, right, to, to observe all his teachings. This is part of his teachings. Jesus says, be ye perfect as I am, right? Does he say, be ye holy as I am holy, right? Be ye perfect as I am perfect. How is that accomplished? only through Jesus. That's why he says he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Understanding that today, church. Understanding that today is perfect. So, but here's here's the thing about right, uh, righteousness. And you want to see some of the things that Jesus come to do? Sermon on the Mount is very good at this. We just read a part of it. True righteousness makes one think of God and not men. So, true righteousness in your life is always going to point to Jesus. It's always going to point to God and not men. He says, let the, the good deeds shine. So, all the deeds that's in your life is all going to point to, to the Father. So they may see the works that are coming out of your life and glorify the Father who is in heaven, right? Give Him glory and give Him praise. Listen, that happens in you without sometimes you even saying a word. It says, let your life shine before Him, right? Let your life shine. Let it shine. <coughs> Don't hold back. Let it shine. Everywhere you go, let it shine. We want control of this temple, but it belongs to Him. It belongs to Him. This belongs to Him. My voice belongs to Him. So we just let Him have it. I say let Him have it. Let Him have your voice. Because I promise you, if you let Him have your voice, somebody's getting healed. I promise you, you let Him have your voice, somebody's going to get prophesied over. I promise you, you let Him have your voice, somebody's going to get touched by God today. Right? Because Jesus went about good, right? He went about good, doing good, and, and, and delivering those that were oppressed by the enemy, right? Bringing victory into the lives of those that were oppressed by the enemy. What am I saying? If you want to see these signs, wonders, and miracles, you follow him, yes, but you allow him to flow freely through you. So people can see the works of the kingdom of God in your life and glorify your Father in heaven. Like this week, literally, God wants to save people from come, coming through your life this week. All we have to do is let Him, let him have control. Let Him have the liberty to do that. True righteousness glorifies God. Philippians 1, 6 says this, and I am certain that God who began to work within you will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So the good work, right? The one that began the good work within you will continue it. Somebody say continue. You have to give him permission. And he wants to continue the work that in your life until he comes back. Philippians 1 6. Yes, and we'll skip down to, to, to verse 9. It says, I pray that you your love will overflow more and more. Say, do it, Jesus. <clears throat> and, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. That's the mind. Keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. He 
He says in verse 10, For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives into the day of Christ's return. Verse 11, he says, May you always be filled, somebody say be filled, with the fruit of your salvation. Mm. Woo. The fruit of your salvation. The righteous, don't think about works, righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Say Christ does it. Hallelujah. He does it all. We have to give you permission. <clears throat> True righteousness shows in deeds as well as words, right? We would be a people of our words. True righteousness goes beyond human law and requirements. We see that we see that several times. Uh, the scribes and the, the, the Pharisees, they had legal righteous, righteousness. And that's not good enough. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds the, the Pharisees, right? And the Sadducees, unless your, your righteousness exceeds them, you're not going to see the kingdom. Right? Because they don't have God's heart. They have a form of godliness. Right? A form of godliness. That's appearance. That's appearance. They look like they have everything together, but their heart's far from God. So, <clears throat> legal righteousness is not, it's not good enough. It's, it's, it's not enough. So, he's relating to the spirit rather than over, over acts or works. It's not grudging adherence to the letter of the law. You see, understand, yes, you will face temptation in your flesh, but understand your whole life is not a temptation, okay? God wants you to get past that, your whole life being a temptation. You live by the Spirit and not by the flesh, right? If you live by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires when I say desires that's, that's a big word go check that word out desires control a lot of your life understand if God's in control of your desires you desire him and you desire the things that he wants you to desire that's loving him with all your heart soul mind and strength and loving your neighbor right as yourself yes this continually Continually, like your life is just one life glorifying God and touching everybody else's life around you. See, you ain't got to worry about temptations of your own self if you're busy loving God and loving people. Amen? Your life becomes that. It's not a grudging effort to do it. No, it, it flows naturally out of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. <clears throat> So it's not grudging to the letter of the law, but loving loving obedience to God's will. He says, if you love me, you keep my commands. Right? And we always thought if, if we don't keep his commands, we must not love him. But what he's saying in that, right? He says, once you're filled up with the love of God, it's just going to happen naturally. You're not going to have to work to keep the commands of God. It's just going to it's going to be your life. Amen. You're just going to be full with this kind of love that loves God and you don't have a desire to break every law in the book. <laughs> so, like salt and light, we work quietly doing God's will or making noise for Jesus without a thought for personal gains, all for His glory. It's motivated by the concern for others. Light shines not to be seen but to allow others things to be seen. Listen about salt. Salt preserves not itself but whatever it is a host over. That's what salt does. Salt is made with an intention was made with an intention back in the day. It was made with an intention to to <clears throat> get the words out of my mouth right. <clears throat> it was 
made with the intention to preserve, right? Salt wasn't made to preserve itself. Salt was made, it was made to preserve something else, right? And this is what he's saying about salt. Your life, right, because of what Christ has done in it, it's made to touch other people's lives. You're not made to just live this life for yourself, by yourself, on this earth, but it's made to touch other people's lives. You have, because of Christ living in you, the answer to what the world needs. You have the answer for their sickness. You have the answer for their disease. You have the answer for, come on, for any bondage that they're facing, any demonic activity in their life, in their family. You are the answer because the answer lives in you. He lives in you. Says, since we're that light, Jesus says we must be pure. How do you, how, how's your light shine? It shines by spending time with the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world, right? <clears throat> I want you to see something about light. When, when Jesus says he's the light of the world, I want you to see he's talking about, he is talking about purity, he's talking about righteousness, but something he's talking about is knowledge okay he's he's the knowledge and the truth to the world in other words and the Bible talks about that Satan is the power of darkness he's talking about ignorance that's why the Bible says know the truth and the truth will make you free See, Satan's power comes from our ignorance in our lives. Jesus is that light that shows us the truth. Come on, somebody. He's the light that comes in and shows us the truth. He's the knowledge of truth, right? He's the bread of life. Mm, so good. So righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees is being in, in relationship. Somebody say relationship. Being in personal relationship produces true righteousness. Not upholding the law. Upholding the law does not produce true righteousness. But being in a relationship, personal relationship with Him produces righteousness in your life. Produces the favor of God. You can get close to God as you choose to. Amen. You can get as close to Him as you choose to. Jesus paid for you to go all the way in. All the way in. You want to know the mysteries of God? What's God doing right now? You can go all the way in and find out. Amen. What's God saying to this generation right now? You can go all the way in and find out. Because that veil has been torn so you can get just as near to him as you choose to you can draw near to him what stops you from doing that I'm gonna tell you what you thinking that you're a sinner stops you from doing it you thinking that your life's messed up will stop you from getting close to God it's the enemy warring with your mind it's religion roaring with your mind messing with your faith Come on, somebody. If Jesus is in you, He's paid it all. He's paid the highest price for your life. You can go to Him. How we approach the throne of grace. Right? But what's the word? Boldly. Right? Boldly approach the throne of grace. Like with confidence that when you approach the throne of grace that you're Father is going to embrace you. He's going to embrace you. He's going to embrace what you're saying. He's going to listen to you, right? Think about a king on a throne. And the people coming in, you ever seen uh, Emperor's New Groove? The Emperor's New Groove, the cartoon? How would they come to the throne? They come to the throne, just shake and shake and shake. Right? Right, because they had a, a dictator on the throne. <laughs> What's her name? Bishma? 
Eastman was trying to be on the throne, but it was uh, who was the emperor? Anyway, that's a cartoon. You go check it out. It's pretty funny. But uh, I like car I like cartoons better than movies, y'all. To be honest with you. So, <clears throat> amen. So, any anyway, the picture of the king and a servant coming to the king is terrifying, right? It's terrifying. But he says boldly you can approach the throne of grace. Why? Because you're not a servant anymore. You're not like to God that he doesn't consider you a servant. Look at the product, the story of the prodigal son. Right? Even when the son messed up and went out and done his own things, he still called him a son. He's come on. And if you're a daughter, you messed up some things in your life, you're still a daughter. He still considers you to be a daughter. He's just waiting for you to come home. Right? And he's saying you can boldly approach the throne of grace. And he's there, he's there to meet you where you're at. <clears throat> I mean, you know, God, God runs the prodigals. Woo. Did you hear what I said? Did you know God runs? It says in the, in the, in the story of the prodigal sons that he ran to the son. Amen? He ran to him. So when you're messing up, the enemy wants you, the last person he wants you to talk to is God. He wants you to talk to everybody but God. He wants to talk to your friend about your sin. He wants you to talk, he wants anybody that, that, that cannot help you, he wants you to talk to them. Yeah, but who does the Father want you to talk to? He wants you to talk to him. He actually is the one that when you come to him, he's going to, come to you. Amen? Come on, somebody. Religion's being broke today in the name of Jesus. Second principle. So the first is righteousness. The second principle. People and this is something that's very valuable to understand. People are worth more than anything else in the world. People are valuable. Matthew 18, 12, it says, What do you think? He says, If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? See, God wants us to love people like, He wants us to have this mindset that loves people like He loves them. Amen? How many has been that one before? I've been that one. Right? So who, would, who, would, who would leave these valuable 99 that are on the hill and go and find the one? Right? And our minds is like, just let them work it out. No. He leaves the flock and he'll find the one. That's love, church. That's love, and that's the love that he's wanting us to have a mindset of and an understanding of that we're to look out for our brothers and sisters, that if God considers them the most valuable in the world, we, can, we should consider them the most valuable in the world. Amen? Every soul matters. Every life matters. Every person matters to God. They have a purpose for being here. Or God would have never created them. They have a specific intention for them being on this earth or God would have never created them. And you got to know that today. If you're here today, you've been created for a reason. And you have value. You have value. Your life is meaningful or you would not be breathing today. Humans are, are unique in all of God's creation. You know something I love about Jesus? Jesus, he preached to the multitudes, but he still spent time with the individuals. Come on, somebody, that's so good. He's, 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 he preached to the masses of people, like, and he still took this personal time to one-on-one, -on -one. Like, just think about Zacchaeus. Everybody hates this dude. He's a short guy. 
I think that's why they're hating him. But he's a short guy. Right? He's a tax collector. I mean, you love the IRS, right? No, he's... <laughs> no, literally, like, he's a, he's, a, he's a legal robber and a thief, okay? He's a legal robber and a thief. Like, he can legally take more taxes, and he had been taking more taxes than were required. So everybody didn't like this joker, okay? So he gets in this tree, and we're talking about the creator of the universe is coming. Jesus, can, he, can, he can proclaim, right, the, the good news right there. He can heal people, deliver people, set people free. He can do all of those things that day, right? But he sees Zacchaeus, and at some point he stops. He says he's going to come to his house. He says, I'm coming to your house today. People are like, what? what? And that was a big uproar in the religious this man, he's, he's eating with sinners and, 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 and tax collectors. But Jesus is pointing a picture to them to understand these are the people that need him. And understand today, those are the people that need God. This is why we're on this street. This is why we're in this city. Why we have a ministry in Bogalusa? Bogalusa is, is ranked like the second worst city in the state. Why not have a ministry in the city of Bogalusa? This is the place where revival is going to come. This is the place where Jesus would be. Come on, hallelujah, somebody. This is the place where he'd be. Why? Because tax collector once he met Jesus he knew he needed Jesus right he had this he had this talk with Jesus this relationship with Jesus he had an encounter with Jesus listen by the time the Jesus got done in that conversation he, he says I'm gonna, I'm gonna give what a, I forget the amount he says I'm gonna give back a, a, like five times the amount that I took I taken for people I'm gonna give it all back Powerful. People are important. Genesis 1.27 it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. 2 Peter 3.9, it says, The Lord isn't being slow about his promises, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake been patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. And I'm going to close with that word, repent, because this is a word we got jacked up in the church too. Would you stand? Repent. At the root of the word in the Greek and Hebrew, it's not a word that is meant. You know, some of it is it's turned from the direction that you're going to turn and, and go in a, a totally different direction. Jesus says something amazing, though. Where John the Baptist actually starts it. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? And then Jesus comes with the same message, repent for the kingdom. Somebody say kingdom. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And... Uh, what we need to understand about that word repent and something we have to get beyond is we think of the word repent it just means to be sorry for what you did or have remorse for what you did or be sorry for what you did look that's a little bit of the word repentance but it's so much bigger than that so much bigger than that the word actually uh, is a word that means meta metanoia that it means to change the way that you think right change the way you think. That's why it's so important. We talked about it this morning. Uh, religion, religion, sin, fear, depression, all of these things, doubts, all of these things are aimed to keep you away from God. 
So it, when, when Jesus is saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's not telling the people to be sorry. Okay? He's not telling them to be sorrowful. He's not telling them any of that. He's telling them to change the way they think because they've been doing, they've been doing religious rituals for so long that they're going to have to get that out of their lives in order to receive what he's bringing. That makes sense? And that's what we have to understand today. When you repent of your sins, it, it means more than you just getting forgiveness for your sins. But it, it means that God is coming into you, is changing the way that you think. And you're going to continue that process of changing the way you think by knowing more and more and more about God. Yes, when you repent and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, He comes into your life, He forgives you of your sins, He cleanses you, He washes you, He makes you new, right? Born again, right? Born again. Completely new. But the, the process of you maintaining that is knowing more and more about God, changing the way that you think every day. The old is gone. All things have been made new. Amen. I'll give the Lord some praise today. Jesus, we worship you today, Jesus. We magnify you today, Jesus. We give you glory. We give you praise. We come to you today. We come to you. And I, I want you to, I want you to, today, if, if you, if you need him in your life, if you need him in your life, right now is the time. You don't have to come to the altars right there where you're at. If you want to come down here and pray, you can. But I'm telling you, right there where you're at, God can meet you right there. Hallelujah. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That word at hand means it's here. It's arrived. It's, it's here. It's near. The kingdom of heaven is among us today. Right? Right? The kingdom of heaven is among us today. It means you have this opportunity and this choice to be made right with the kingdom and, and to become a citizen in the kingdom of God. Become a citizen in the kingdom of God. Just think to yourself right here, right now, what are you a citizen of currently? Do you belong to God? Are you under His citizenship? Are you under God's authority? Do you belong to Him today? that one nobody knew. <laughs> the joy of the Lord. <laughs> Y'all wanna dance to it? We can turn it back on. <laughs> Amen. But your citizenship is so important and valuable for you to understand. Like who do you belong to today? You belong to God. You belong to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Have you entered into that? Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us perfectly how to get there. It says, if you confess you with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God who raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right? Right? It's confession with your mouth. Right? You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right? Hallelujah. Father, today, we come to you today. We thank you. Come on, and just everybody pray this today. If if you want to pray a prayer, you want to call a prayer of salvation, you mean it from your heart. You mean it from your heart and you confess it with your mouth. And we're going to pray this together today. And if you're in this number, you're going to be born in, into the kingdom of God. Born again today. Born again into the kingdom of God. Amen. Jesus, we come to you today. We thank you for your love for your mercy, your kindness, and your goodness. Jesus, we believe that you went to the tree and you died to save me from my sins, from my life, from living my own way. I believe that. I trust you today with all of my heart, with all of my mind, all of my soul. I give you my life today, Jesus. Come in. 
bring transformation, bring restoration, reconcile me back with the Father today. I thank you, I praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, celebrate the Lord today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If, if you prayed that, man, the next step, if this is your first time praying a prayer, amen, the, the next step is baptism. Baptism, you be baptized in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to put it out there. You ain't got to do this. If you prayed that prayer today, why don't you just raise your hand. Raise your hand. We'll pray right where, you, right where you're at. Amen. Now to pray the prayer in general. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We love you. We praise you. We magnify you for every, every new heart today. Every new heart. Every new mind touched by you today, Jesus. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, Lord. We say this week, God, we will... We will manifest the kingdom of God in our lives, into the lives around us, Jesus. We thank you for the moving of your spirit in our hearts, in our lives. In Jesus' name, we thank you for touching, for moving, for transforming lives around us. We ask you to keep us safe. Keep us safe this week. We ask you, Lord, to provide for us everything that we're in need of, Lord. We thank you for healing. We thank you for deliverance. We give you praise, Lord, for the fullness of your spirit operating in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Love on somebody today. You're dismissed. In Jesus' name.